It's good to be with you again. I'm Lana Miller and currently working at Everance as a stewardship consultant. I hope you were able to find spaces to be in and with nature this past week and that you might continue to create some spaces to learn from creation. One of the ways that we're beginning to pause and recognize our place in creation is through land acknowledgement statements that pay attention to the ground that we inhabit and those that have gone before us. In January, I participated in the School for Leadership training at Eastern Mennonite Seminary. And we began each worship session with these words written by Sarah Nahar. It's with humble gratitude, the Blacks Run and Cub Run, the Shenandoah Watershed, and to the many species calling this home and to the complex groupings of indigenous people, cultural ancestors of Monacan, Haudenosaunee, Shawnee, and others. The traditional tenders of the lands and waters of this place who moved through this gorgeous valley. May all I say be a blessing to their past, present, and future elders. Perhaps you've heard such land acknowledgement statements. In many of these statements, we recognize the people, flora, and fauna that have been displaced. Joanne invites us on the last page of this session to reflect on how this kind of acknowledgement might help us restore property in our modern context. As the passage for today from Leviticus invites us to consider what jubilee means for us today. Building relationships with and learning from those outside of our normal social, cultural, and racial contexts is imperative as we seek to be fully grounded and understand God's desires for this world. We've started with the end. Let's go back to the beginning of this lesson. This is the second lesson in Stewards of God's Creation entitled, A Sabbath for All Creation. So I wonder what your experiences with Sabbath have been over the course of your life. When I was growing up in the 80s, I remember some stores and restaurants weren't always open on Sunday. Sunday was a day to go to church. Perhaps that was the extent of Sabbath, not working and dutifully attending church. I'm thankful for the ritual of attending church. I don't think that that fully grasps, however, the meaning of Sabbath. I'm not sure that I ever really thought about Sabbath as a practice in trusting God's provision over my own self-reliance. It's interesting to think about the need to do and produce And if the practice of Sabbath has actually impacted the way that I live and how I view the rest of creation. It's a challenge for me to practice Sabbath today. It's something that I have to be very intentional about or it doesn't really happen. What about you? Ugo gives several good questions at the bottom of page 51 to reflect on Sabbath together with your class. And after you've had some time to reflect on your experiences with Sabbath and how that's changed over time, I'd invite you to consider his last question. Who or what is most affected by the practice of honoring or not honoring the Sabbath? Next, I'd read the passage from Leviticus 25, 1 to 13, and invite people to especially listen to verse four, where it says, in the seventh year, there shall be a Sabbath of complete rest of the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. How does this passage from Leviticus help expand our perspectives of what Sabbath should or could look like? You may wanna talk a little bit about what Sabbath for the land actually means. There's some good examples of Thinking about fallow land, maybe people have experience with this. I'm sure if you have farmers in the group, they may have some thoughts and ideas about this as well. I'm struck by Joanne's writing on page 53. She says, good horticulture tells us to let the land lie fallow regularly. 
But there's it's nothing practical about leaving all the fields fallow for a year. Instead, it's a sign of our trust that what God has provided is sufficient and a reminder that more is not necessarily better. The Levitical laws for the Sabbath point to a generosity that's not about rewarding those who we deem deserving or for self-serving ends. It's a generosity born out of a sense of having enough. Her words are profound. Over the last four years, working at Everence as a stewardship consultant, I found her thoughts to be so central to the conversations I think we need to be having in the church. The land and how we treat the land through the idea of Sabbath indeed does inform how we remember, honor, and celebrate God and God's creation of this world. We are part of a culture that entices us to think that more is always better. And it's the answer to everything. But Sabbath reminds us to ask, what is enough? And how might we, I, live in a way that others might also have enough. As a church, as parents, as individuals living in Christian community, this is perhaps one of the most important conversations of our time. It's not just a hypothetical question, but it's practical. How are we really living in relationship with God and one another? How are we practicing living with enough? This ties to my opening comments regarding how we practice living in Jubilee today. Who are the people who have been displaced and harmed? How have plants and animals been taken from the land? What is our opportunity and perhaps obligation to bring restoration today? Joanne's questions on page 54 are helpful in tying together this conversation of enough and Sabbath. She asks, what has the entire created world lost by both our inability to stop and say enough and our tendency to see every corner as a resource to be worked? The second question she asks is, what routines can we ritualize so that they they charge our lives more fully with what we value? I think both of these questions are important for us to wrestle with in this lesson. So take some time here. Ugo suggests various activities for remembering, honoring, and celebrating the natural gift of God's world. One of these activities might be fitting for your group. As you close the lesson, there are several suggestions of hymns and poems that could be read. I'd invite you to read or sing together some of these. I offer an excerpt from Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teachings of Plants by Robin Wall Kimmerer. Perhaps these guidelines for the honorable harvest are a way to explore Joanne's closing question on page 55. How can we give back to the rest of creation in appreciation for the benefits we've derived from it? Know the ways of the ones who take care of you so that you may take care of them. Introduce yourself. Be accountable as the one who comes asking for life. Ask permission before taking. Abide by the answer. Never take the first, never take the last. Take only what you need. Take only that which is given Never take more than half, leave some for others. Harvest in a way that minimizes harm. Use it respectfully. Never waste what you've taken. Share. Give thanks for what you've been given. Give a gift in reciprocity for what you have taken. Sustain the ones who sustain you, and the earth will last forever. Thank you for the time taking to prepare the lesson this week. I hope these lessons are transformative for you and for your class. Blessings as you prepare.